today on Ask This Old House. We'll share some of our own holiday renovation nightmares. So my mom, who has Good a boy. great spirit, right? I can see the grin. Yeah. And as I found out later, the only reason she thought it was funny was because my dad was going to be twice as mad at me. <laughs> I'm going to share a few of my favorite things about Christmas trees. Their branching structure, their stiffer branches. I love the color, that dark green, and the underside of that bluish tone. And I'll show you how to turn the front of your house into a winter wonderland. So we're going to start with the icicle lights in the gutter. OK. To do this, we're going to use a clip. Cool. Pete, I love it. It's just magical. I wish you the happiest of holidays. You too, and thanks for having me. Hey, everybody. I'm Kevin O'Connor. I'm Jen Nawada. You got that, Jen? Of course I got All right, that. I'll meet up with you later. Welcome back to another episode of Ask This Old House. It's actually the last time we're all together here in the barn before the holidays. So hopefully you're all looking forward to a nice holiday as well. Hey, gang. Hey, how are you? Looks like a lot of work's going on down no, here. No, it isn't, but we just started hanging around and we started sort of talking about holiday nightmares and it really started to get out of hand. Oh my goodness, <laughs> holiday nightmares for contractors. Right. You guys' phones yeah. must be yeah. ringing off the hooks, right? Yeah. Yeah. Who's got a good one? Well, you had one. I have one. Having the in-laws and my family over for the first Thanksgiving in our house, we were just finished from renovating. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, literally last-minute repairs, like always. We had the plumber over the day before, finishing yeah. the kitchen sink, cutting up the loose ends, getting everything ready. So everyone's there. Everything's going well. Dinner's great. Everyone's cleaning up their own plates, bringing them to the sink, putting everything in. I'm not paying attention. All of a sudden, I'm getting yelled at that the sink's backing up in the kitchen. Oh, plumber, no. gets, plumber gets blamed. Plumber was just there. Yeah. Why is the sink backing up? Go over awesome. to take a look. Of course it's you. So I go in there and taking a look. I'm like, why is this not draining? It's filling up. I'm like, the garbage disposal's right there. Everyone's been putting their food in. And, oh, yeah. I guess you have to wire a garbage disposal in order oh, for it to actually oh, work. Was the electrician here? I, I don't want to point oh, fingers, but. <laughs> so in the middle of Thanksgiving, I'm under the sink tying it in so we can get right. it to drain. Right. Nice way to impress the in-laws. Yeah, right. yeah, it went over they, well. They like them now, though. Yeah, they're yeah. very yeah. impressed. Great right. first impression. All oh, right. <laughs> My nightmares are pretty mundane, but it was always the day after Thanksgiving or Christmas because everybody that had the clogged kitchen sink needed us to come, and it never was better the day after. That and also the memory of my Uncle Donald who drank a lot on Christmas, but we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> Eggnog. <laughs> Eggnog. Well, I also have one, but involves my mom. One Thanksgiving season, like every good boy, I went over to say hello to my mom. It was about a week before Thanksgiving, and I noticed a little bit of stress on her. So, of course, mom's stressing, I'm stressing. Yeah. Mom, what's wrong? Mark, the plumber just left. Uh, he was going to come do a new bathroom for her. Plumber showed up and said, hey, it's not demoed. I can't do my thing. Oh, no, there goes the my home. mom thought that she, the guy was going to come in, demo everything, and be done. So I said, lucky you, mom. I'm your guy. <laughs> I'm going to back my truck up, get into the bathroom, tear it apart. Nobody does demo like no. you, Mark. You know. I'll go right at it. Arr. Such a good boy. That's, yeah, such yeah, a good son. Son. That's right, being a good <laughs> son. So anyway, I'm tearing the place apart. Everything's going well. I'm going from the, the bathroom to a window to the, my truck. So smooth operation. I'm all finished. I go back down to see my mom. I said, hey, mom, I'm all done. You know, call the tile guy. Call the plumber back. Let's get this thing going. She said, I didn't, I didn't hear anything. So where were you? So I was, I was in, in your bedroom. I walked into the master bath and went to town. Wrong bathroom. <laughs> Oh, no. Wrong bathroom. Wrong bathroom. So my mom, who has Good a, boy. She's a great spirit, right? Uh, I can see the grin. Yeah. And I'm uh, nervous, right? So she's starting to laugh a little bit. And of course, as I find out, the only reason she's laughing is because she knows how mad my dad's going to be. Yeah. <laughs> so I had to put up with that. You know what she also knows? You still got another bathroom to demo. So I went right back upstairs. <laughs> and you're rebuilding. <laughs> oh, that's right back upstairs. The oh, only yeah. guy who had extra work in my mind was yeah. the was the plumber and the tile guy. The night the nightmares all work out. So uh, well, she wanted that one renovated anyway I was too. Gonna say. <laughs> it's good. It's always it something. Happen. Always something. Yeah, always. Oh, good. You were able to muscle the back here. Thank you. And you got it standing up, too. It looks it so looks good. It looks so awesome. I love it. I love that it. That puts you in the spirit, right? And it just it takes me back to that beautiful trip Roger took us on to the tree farm. We've got about 15 acres here. We're growing close to 14,000 trees on it. 
Now, how many different species? About 13 different species. The tree farm. I mean, what a great expedition that was. There's all different kinds of furs at that farm. So there was Douglas furs, Fraser furs, Concolor furs, and balsam furs. And I have to say, furs are my favorite for Christmas trees because a couple really important reasons, like their branching structure, their stiffer branches. I love the color, that dark green, beautiful, beautiful branch of that, and the underside has that bluish tone. Right. So. I'm a fur person. What about you? I'm actually with you and Roger. Fur is my favorite too. I, I don't even know why. I mean, it just to me it says Christmas tree. And also, to me, it's like the most fragrant, right? Right. You break one needle and that smell just brings yeah. you back. And as I said, they look like Christmas trees. Although I'm not sure people appreciate, you know, just how by design this whole process is. They, they think they're walking around in the forest right. cutting down trees. It, it's actually a farm. There's right. a lot of thought and planning that goes into a tree farm. Right. These trees here are small balsams, probably about two years old. Two years old? They don't grow much the no. first two years. No, the first few years they get up out of the ground, and that's about it. They start tiny, and as they grow, they transplant them, and they give them room, space to grow, and when they get to be about four feet tall is when shearing time comes. Pruning and shearing is a, it's a big deal for a Christmas tree farmer. You have to pay attention to the top and bottom. So this is called the terminal leader, right? This, this single guy sticking up right here? Right, you typically want one piece going up. So you cut it eight to 10 inches and you cut it right below a good bud. And then you take off the, the buds below that so you don't have multiple leaders. Yeah, and so you say buds, I'm not sure people appreciate this. This is the bud. These are the buds at the tip and they don't look like anything now, but what they're going to do is emerge with new growth. So this dictates how much the plant will grow. So if you follow this down the stem, you ask how much did the tree grow this year? It grew about seven, seven and a half inches. And that's because last year those nubs were right here. Correct. And so everything past that point, as you say, this is all new growth. Right. And so mid-June to July is when you want to prune and shear for the shape of the Christmas tree. So this will be a different color when it comes out. It's soft. So during that time period of uh, June, July is when you want to cut it before it hardens off. And when it hardens off, that means before it becomes this stiff type of needles. Um, and, and darker color, right? Because a new growth is sort of a lighter green. Yeah, you need to cut it during that time period before it hardens off, because so it creates that nice end in that. And then you could achieve your pyramidal shape right. of the tree. So concentrate on the top pruning, mm -hmm. concentrate on the bottom of the pruning right here. And then well, this moving... is called the shearing. The shearing. So this. And then you travel to the bottom, and this, this is called the basal pruning. And so what you want to do is cut all the branches to create this nice base. And also, think of like a bike wheel. You want all these branches to come out from the center. So those are called world branches. And once you do that, it establishes a good base, and you have balance on the tree, and also a great handle to put it into the tree base when you bring it into your house. Yeah, but let's be honest. We need room for the presents, right? <laughs> so you might need to put it up like yeah, two yeah. feet high. Yes, absolutely, you gotta spoil those kids on Christmas, right? So you end up with a beautifully shaped tree like this if you go to a good farm, and then mm -hmm. the first thing you do is, well these days, you wrap it up in that cool netting that they have. Oh my gosh, that thing is awesome. You send it through the machine, it just goes, yep. sucks it up, and you throw it on the top of your car or in your car. Yeah. And then when you bring it home, you, take, you don't take off the net yet, you put it in the tree stand, fill it with water, which is very important. Hopefully at the, at the tree place, you get a nice fresh cut, and so it absorbs all the water because you do not want your tree to dry out because it'll start dropping needles and become a fire hazard. Yeah, which is sort of the flip side to an otherwise joyous thing. And that is, we've learned that house fires spike in December. Right. And I had the opportunity to go to just outside of Chicago to the UL laboratories, mm -hmm. Underwriter Laboratories, I where they tested that. everything. Right. We talked about Christmas trees and we learned about that December spike in I house fires. I remember seeing right? that. Yes, it's terrible. And if I recall, it's there's scary. two Two big culprits, mm -hmm. right? There's the candle. Yep. So mom or grandma sets the big table and puts candles on it and they get left unattended or yep. they get knocked over. You get a fire that way. Every time there's a fire, people say, I just left the room for a second. Mm. And when I came back, it was a blaze. So what's the tip? No the candles? The tip is just blow out the candle when you leave the room. Don't let it sit there alone. And the reason for that, Kevin, is simply because a dog could bump it, a cat could bump it, children could bump the table, mm -hmm. or it could just fall over by itself because it wasn't inserted hard enough into the candle holder. Yeah. And then, of course, there's the dried out Christmas tree. And it's right. got lights on it, right? Faulty wiring or it's whatever. Kindling. It's kindling. Yeah. It is kindling. And I tell you what, Jen. 
we, we, we burned these trees right there in the controlled laboratory. It was terrifying to see. This is 15 seconds into it. The drier the tree, the more heat it gives off. That's right, and heat release is the better indicator of your safety. That is an inferno. That tree is almost gone, and it's only about 45 seconds now. And that tree is um, so far gone, and the house and the room is so far gone, you need the fire department for sure to take care of this. And then they went and they compared it to an artificial tree, mm -hmm. which was also terrifying, although it turned out to be a pretty good story, because they burned and they gave off a ton of smoke, mm -hmm. but it turns out it smoldered slowly, so yeah. a lot of smoke sets off your smoke alarms, it alerts you to get out of the house, and the tree's not burning as quickly. Right, right, so right. So of the two, it was sort of the safer, but either way, that it's That was a, the safer one. You don't want to see a Christmas tree burn. Right, you right. You want to see it filled with ornaments and presents beneath it. So moral of the story is water your tree. Keep it Simple. water. Simple. Yep. And you know what? Right now, I guarantee you somewhere, Roger's out in the woods cutting down these trees. I thought I saw him with an ax the other day. So Richard, the holiday season is upon us and uh, everyone is out merrymaking, but for you it's a busy time, isn't it? There are only two people you don't want to be around the holidays. One is the turkey <laughs> and the other is the plumber on the day after Thanksgiving or the holidays. A tough day for you guys. Yeah, a lot of food goes down. It's the most used day of the year for a kitchen. So I thought we would talk today a little bit about the basic disposer. Now this is the most basic one right here and this is a cutaway so you can understand what goes on inside. Mm -hmm. Water and foodstuffs go down here. Just below here is the upper chamber. Here's the discharge from a dishwasher if you have it, yep. and that comes into here. Now, when you turn it on, the motor will spin this grinding wheel, and this is a single grinding wheel right here, that'll shred the food and throw it down through the drain right here. Now, there's some safety features down below it that many people don't know about. Right here is a reset button. If the motor ever overheated, this button would trip and you'd have to push it in, and that sometimes will do it. It also, many of them also come with a wrench, and that's designed to go right here and then turn to try to clear any stoppage or jam that's up here at the top. Yes. Now, sometimes that's not enough, and you can take a couple of broom handles or stuff like that and come down through the top of the sink, put them in opposing directions against those teeth right here and try to clear it, okay? And you're using that because obviously you would never stick your hand down inside. And that's an important safety feature, never uh, with the uh, power on. You're saying this is the most basic, why? Because it's uh, just a small Everything. power? Everything. It's, it's the smallest motor, one-third horsepower. It has a single grinding wheel. And the fact is, it's the cheapest model on the market, so that's what most people end up with. Mm. But they go up in size, and this moves up to the larger size right here. This is one horsepower versus one-third horsepower. This has three grinding wheels, so it really pulverizes everything, and this thing is super insulated and quiet. So this thing will grind up just about anything. Right, just about anything, but not actually anything. Right, so I brought some samples of wow. some of the, just some of the stuff that goes down the drain. No, we need that. So have you ever been inside a disposer? I haven't. All right, well here is your disposer right here. The way we activate it here is an air switch. You always want to run cold water uh, when you're doing it, okay? We have a clear trap underneath so you can see what's going on. We'll start with uh, potato skins. People think these are a problem. No problem. No problem. And uh, what do you think about carrots? Don't put them all down at once and just let the cold water run just so they can grind up and move through. The cool. tricky part is anything with strings. Celery, uh, particularly long strands of celery, you see, doesn't even want to cut them. And some of the basic disposers, raw meat will get you too. The meat itself will get caught in the grinding wheel and the bones can jam it up. All right, can you reach your hand in there? The power's off, which is really important. Yeah, but you that. see, that's just been bouncing that around. It's, it's just pulverizing, but it's not grinding up because it's only got the single wheel. And over time, you might get through, but it's going to end up down the drain a little bit. So you really just need to know the list of what can and can't yeah. go in, and yeah. don't try to right. overtax right. the machine. And also the pits inside of peaches or avocados. I mean, people will do this and throw that pit down there, and that is literally the pits. Yeah, I could just spin it around. Ironically, the biggest culprit is not the hard stuff, it's actually a liquid, grease like this. An important rule is to always run cold water when you're working around grease. Why not uh, warm water so that it flows like liquid? Well, now it goes down into that horizontal pipe that might be in the basement. It then congeals, and now it would stick to the sides of the horizontal pipe. But the best way is not to run any grease down there if you can help it. 
So with a basic disposer, avoid grease, bones, pits, and the stringy stuff, and you should be okay. Absolutely. Hi, Whitney. Hey, Heath. Welcome. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Thanks so much for coming. Oh, thanks for having me. Of course. So what am I taking a look at today? All right, so my husband and I bought this house about a year ago. Mm -hmm. This is our first Christmas in the house. Nice. We have two little ones, a three and a one-year-old, and we just really want to make this Christmas really magical for Absolutely. them. So we went out, we bought a bunch of Christmas decorations. Uh, we put some lights on the shrubs, as you can see. Yeah, the shrubs look great. Thanks. But then we realized we don't have an outdoor outlet. No problem. We have an outlet in the porch, so we just ran a cord through the window there. Uh, and you know I'm not going to like that. Yeah. We don't want to run the cord through the window like that, especially a metal storm window. Okay. We have the weight of that metal window coming down on the cord. It could chafe through, cause an issue down the road. And on top of that, we're leaving a window open. So we're letting Got it draft it. into the house and the window can't do its job. Sure. So what we'd really like to do is add an outdoor receptacle for that so we don't have to run the cord through and then you can plug things in. Are you looking to add more lights as well? Yes, we oh. have a lot more that we need some help putting up. Great. So we'll make sure we give plenty of power to that outside receptacle and we'll show you how to hang the rest of the lights safely. That'd be awesome. All right, let's get going. Let's do it. All right, so I've done a little looking around in the basement. Okay. Uh, I think this is going to be a good spot for our outdoor receptacle. It does a couple of things for us. It gives us easy access to getting to the front for the holiday lights. Okay. We can use it in the driveway if you want to run a vacuum for a car or cleaning of any type. And if you have outdoor electric equipment, like a leaf blower, you can plug in right here, Perfect. easy use. And the reason we want to install it over there is I want to stay away from this water spigot as far as we can and still have it comfortable. Okay. The other nice thing we have is we actually have an abandoned 20 amp circuit up in the ceiling right here that's in a box. That runs all the way back to the panel. It's not being used. We're gonna take advantage of that by putting another junction box right here, run a wire across the joist inside, and then pop out and put the receptacle over here. We'll have a dedicated 20 amp circuit. and We'll be good to go. Great. All right, let's get started. All right. I'm gonna start by drilling a hole to run the new electrical wires through. I don't wanna damage the siding, so first I'll drill a pilot hole before I cut the rest out with a hole saw. Once the siding has been safely cut, I'll switch back to a drill bit to drill through the rest of the sheathing and into the basement. All right, now that we have the hole, I'm gonna give you the wire. If you wanna go in the basement, you can push it out to me. All right. Perfect, I've got it. Now we can install the electrical box for the new receptacle. Because we're outside, I'm using an outdoor rated electrical box that's designed to keep the water out. I'm also going to add a little bit of duct sealer on the connector that we just installed on the back of this box to help seal up the hole we just made in the side of the house. Another thing I'd like to do is add a small bead of silicone to the back edge of the box at the top and on the two sides. By doing this, we'll seal the box against the building, but I'll leave the bottom open just in case we get any moisture back there, it has a chance to escape. For the outlet, I'm using a weather-resistant GFCI receptacle that's designed to trip in case it comes in contact with water and there's a fault. As usual, the ground wire goes in the back to the ground screw, the white wire goes to the silver screw that's for the neutral, and the black wire goes to the brass screw that's for the hot. These wires actually insert straight in and are clamped down instead of coiling around the screws on this device. I also like to add a little electrical tape around the terminals on the device just to cover them up, especially when using a metal box. Finally, I'm going to add this weather resistant cover to protect the receptacle. It has a gasket around the edges that allows it to expand so that the cover can always stay closed even when something's plugged in. Now we can connect the wires in the basement. First thing I'm going to do is take the existing circuit, pull that wire up to a new junction box we're installing on the ceiling. Then I'll take the wire that we just ran outside and bring that into the junction box as well.
We'll then wire nut the conductors together and cover this box up. All right, Whitney, now for the fun part. All right. We get to start installing the lights. So we're going to start with the icicle lights in the gutter. Okay. To do this, we're going to use a clip. This little special clip actually clips onto the lamp, like so. Oh, cool. And then this piece will slide over the front of the gutter and hold everything in place. Great. We're going to do a buttery foot or so. That way it stays nice and straight, and then we'll move on to the next set. This one, we're just going to wrap this post. All right. It's a pre made net just for wrapping a post or the base of a tree. That's awesome. Now we'll just secure it to the top. Look at that. Perfect. Oh, this looks really cool. Perfect. So now that we have all the lights installed, we're going to have to go and run extension cords to each group of lights. So like the tree lights, the icicles, we're going to yep. run a cord back to one central point point. we're going to plug them in. And in order to do that, we're going to use this power distribution module. So what we're going to do is we're going to stake this into the ground to where it's comfortable to use. We're going to run an extension cord from the new receptacle we just installed on the side of the driveway to this unit. And then we're going to take all the cords we ran to the lights groups and we're going to plug them into this one by one. This allows up to six cords to be plugged into this unit Great. to distribute power. And the best part is we have a timer on the top. So we can set it for whenever you want it to come on and go off and you don't have to worry about unplugging them at night. That's great. This cord protector will help keep the moisture out of the connection between the extension cords. All right, everything's plugged in, everything's on. What do you think? Heath, I love it. It's just magical. I think it looks great. And the nice part is we installed that timer so it turns on and off on its own. You don't have to worry about turning it off at night in case you forget. I love that. I'll come home at night and the lights will be waiting for me. Thank you, Heath. I love it. I wish you the happiest of holidays. You too, and thanks for having me. Thanks. Next time on Ask This Old House. Changing out a laugh box, it might be something you could try. I'll take you through the steps. Just be careful not to over torque on old work. You might want to hold back with your hand or with a wrench so you don't snap the pipe off of the wall. And I'll show you how to turn this reclaimed beam into a fireplace mantle. Cut perfect the size, nice and level. Thank cool. you so much. You're welcome.